Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is Advent. It is the season of light and darkness. It is the season of preparation. And we are on a hero's journey. A hero's journey through Advent. We are looking at discipleship through this narrative interpretive lens that we call the hero's journey. Last week we learned that the hero's journey begins in darkness. Or at least a part of the beginning encompasses darkness. As she is called out of the hopelessness of that darkness by the Spirit of the Lord. But the next steps of our hero are often the most precarious. There is a call to stand up against the darkness. To go on an adventure of faith following Christ where he leads. But it will be dangerous. And there will be costs and sacrifices associated with following Jesus. Will you accept the call? Will you follow on the hero's journey? It's natural to refuse the call. To question it. To deny that it's even possible for you to, to answer it. That refusal, that refusal of the call into the adventure of faith is part of the hero's journey. This morning I want you to check out this scene. From the very first Star Wars movie. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack and I'm afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. I have placed information vital to the survival of the Rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. You must learn the ways of the Force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Alderaan? I'm not going to Alderaan. I'm going to get home. It's late. I'm in port as it is. I need your help, Luke. She needs your help. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. I can't get involved. I've got work to do. It's not that I like the Empire. I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. Luke refuses to get involved. He refuses the call. He doesn't like the darkness of the empire, but he can't do it. He's got work, responsibilities, jobs, obligations, and they're all distractions. Do you remember the parable of Jesus inviting the town folk to come to the wedding banquet? I've got to take care of my cow and take care of my wife and take care of my children. Distractions can lead us to refuse the call to our hero's journey. Distractions can keep us from taking the steps we need to take in following Jesus. But of course, as we all know, Luke eventually answers the call. How about another example? In the Harry Potter series, Harry is told that he is a wizard by who will soon be his favorite uh, teacher, Hagrid. And how does he respond? to this amazing news and this call to a new life. Well, listen to these words. Hagrid looked at Harry with warmth and respect blazing in his eyes. But Harry, instead of feeling pleased and proud, felt quite sure that there had been a horrible mistake. A wizard? Him? How could that be possible? 
He'd spent his life being clouded by Dudley and bullied by Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon. If he was really a wizard, why hadn't they been turned into warty toads every time they tried to lock him in his cupboard? Hagrid, he said quietly, I think you must have made a mistake. I don't think I can be a wizard. Self-doubt. The belief that we're not good enough, smart enough, or strong enough can lead us to refuse that something new and wonderful could be true about us. But of course, as we know, Harry answers the call. Distractions, self-doubt, and sometimes we refuse the call because we know it will make us different. Make us stand out or take a different path than our family or our friends or our community. We do things we know in our heart are wrong because we just want to fit in. To belong until maybe something finally breaks and so I want you to check out this one last scene from the movie how to train your dragon is everything. Yes! I have brought down this mighty beast. No. Oh. The hero's journey might require us to refuse the familiar path we've always been told is our path. The expected path, the path of our father, the way of the world, the way everyone else is going. And as we see, Hiccup answers the call and refuses the path that he's expected. And that starts him on a hero's journey. Well, what does all this have to do with us? As disciples in the season of Advent, what does any of this have to do with Isaiah 40 and Mark 1? I'm so glad I made you ask that question. <laughs> right? Right? I want to start with Mark. Start there first. He writes... The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, 
See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. God calls us out of the darkness and into a new adventure. How shall we respond? Like any hero, if we're honest, we refuse the call. We refuse the call and we do it for many reasons. We have responsibilities, things to do at work and children to raise, other things that distract us from taking the call that God has put in our lives. We can't believe it's true about us. We can't believe that God would believe so much in us that He would call us disciples of Christ. Or we know what everyone else is doing. And we know that that's what we're supposed to do. And so we turn away from what God might want us to do. And we say, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what the world would have me do. So we refuse the call. We refuse the nudge of our heart to set aside the distractions, to believe in ourselves and take a different path. But maybe, eventually, you set aside that refusal and you take up the mantle. And when you do so as a disciple, we call this confession and repentance. Confession and repentance is when we acknowledge our refusal to follow God's call and we turn around and take up the mantle. The season of Advent is a time of confession and repentance. To speak of what we have done to refuse God's call and to turn around and answer God's call and take a new path. In one sense, I would suggest to you that the scene that I just showed you from How to Train a Jag Dragon is a perfect visual example of it. Hiccup confesses, I did this. He acknowledges his actions in trapping this creature and looking to kill it. And he thinks he's going to walk away, but then he repents. He confesses first, I did this, but then he repents and he turns around and cuts him free. Confession and repentance. To answer the call, we must confess and repent. And truthfully, we refuse the call to adventure throughout our life. Even after we've said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Do we have moments where we say, not now, Lord. I'm not ready to do what I'm supposed to do. We give in to distractions. We doubt ourselves over and over again. We take the path that the world offers. We're always refusing the call. So confession and repentance is always a part of the hero's journey in discipleship. We confess where we've gone wrong and we repent and turn around and we answer the call again. And this is our life as disciples. And this is what it looks like. And that's the sermon, folks. It's over. It's pretty much all I have to say about that. That's the point. But it's 11.15. I have a few more minutes. So I'm going to do a couple more things. Because there's an important reality that comes up with confession and repentance. Confession and repentance are the next step in the hero's journey. The step in answering God's call into the adventure of faith. But I want to say a little bit more about confession and repentance and what often happens when we enter into this process. When we talk about these steps in our hero's journey, confession and repentance, we necessarily address guilt. Well, what is guilt? Guilt is, I've done something wrong. I violated my value system and I have broken God's law. I stole. 
I may not have wanted to steal, but I stole. I am guilty. Confession and repentance is all about guilt. Acknowledging that we have sinned, we violated our value system, and naming it out loud and then turning around to do the other good thing. But there is a close neighbor to guilt. A close cousin, if you will, that often slips into the door when we acknowledge our guilt. When we take this necessary first step of answering God's call. And what is that close neighbor to guilt? Shame. And what is shame? What is shame? Shame is, I am bad. There is something about me that is unlovable, that is reduced to being inhuman. There is something wrong with who I am in my very core. Now let me say this and hear it well and hear it clear. Confession and repentance is never about shame. We are made for connection, for relationship, and for belonging. Guilt is the feeling that this connection or relationship has been broken by something that we have done or something that we have left undone. We've disconnected from God, from each other, and from creation. And we feel guilty. We confess and repent to acknowledge our guilt, to acknowledge our actions, and to reconnect and reform our relationships. That is what confession and repentance are all about. Now shame, on the other hand, tells us that we're not fit for connection. That we're not good enough for the relationships we have been created to have. Shame tells us we don't belong because we're not lovable. Shame strikes at the core of who we are and how God created us. Human connection is why shame hurts so much. Because it says we're unfit for it. And it rips us apart from the core essence of what it means to be human. In shame, we desperately search for anything that might show us that we are valuable, that we are lovable, that we are worthy. We do whatever we can to try to prove that we are valuable, that we can have connections and relationships. And our society, our social structures are very interesting because we in our society have constructed a lot of realities or hierarchies to teach us how we can be valuable. To show us what we need to do to be valuable or what it means to even have value. If you are rich, if you are beautiful, if you are smart, if you are white, if you are male, if you are Christian, if you are good, then you are valuable. 
then you are worthy and we'll do whatever it takes whatever we can to be valuable shame is a powerful force and God refuses to countenance shame There is no place for shame in God's presence. In fact, I would make it even stronger. What if I said that confession and repentance is God's main tool for combating shame and then ending guilt? Well, let's start with an image from the end of Isaiah 40. We've dealt with Mark a little bit. Let's start with an image from the end of Isaiah 40. Isaiah says, See, the Lord God comes with might, with His arm rules for... Sorry, sorry. He comes with might, with His arm rules for Him. Now, what kind of images do you get in your mind? God comes with might, with His arms He rules for Him. Right? If I read it correctly, you'll get the images in, in your mind, right? So what are the kinds of things that we might imagine we would value with these images? His reward is with Him and His recompense be before Him. He will feed His flock like a shepherd. Now what kind of images are you getting? He will gather the lambs in his arms. Different image of those arms. And then last and maybe most powerfully, and carry them in his bosom. And gently lead the mother sheep. The reward of God is the reconnection. The relationship with the one who picks us up and carries us in his arms. Holds us as close as his very core. These are the strong arms of God that that, that Push away the shame and hold us close. The message of God in this text is something like this. You are mine just the way you are. You don't have to do anything or be anything to be valuable. Do you notice the sheep and the lambs do nothing? They simply are picked up and shown their value by the action of the one who draws them close. You are valuable. And that's where God starts. These are the words of a strong God who brings strong comfort and a God who leads us into confession and repentance not to prove our value, not to make ourselves perfect, not to make ourselves worthy of anything. Those actions are done out of shame. But rather, God has picked us up to drive the shame away and give us a place of confession and repentance and in it to reconnect with God and each other. We are on a hero's journey and our church must be a place of confession and repentance. God has created this place to proclaim you are mine just the way you are. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to be. You are valuable. 
And when we hear that message, in that grace, we can then share our stories. Share our true selves because we're already valuable. We're already held. We're already acknowledged. We can acknowledge our guilt then free from shame. And we can let our shame melt away. For here we learn to listen and let people who love us speak back to us. Here we invite ourselves to acknowledge what we've done so that we can learn to listen through those who love us and hear the words of God. You are valuable. You are loved. It is the hero's journey. You have been called. And you will refuse that call. We all do. In guilt and maybe in shame, you will walk away. But the next step is confession and repentance. Made possible because you hear from God that you belong to God. You are His. And you don't have to do anything or be anything to be valuable to the one who picks you up in his arms, presses you to his bosom, and claims you as his own. You are valuable. This is the second place where I'm tempted to end the sermon. But I wanted to close with a meditation that I found while listening to the latest The Liturgist podcast. Right? It's a meditation that will have you hopefully come to a place where some of the words of the sermon may, may become real for you. So before we start, I want to let you know that you don't have to participate in this. This is not an expectation, it is an invitation. And if you feel like this is difficult, or scary, or weird, I invite you to quietly distract yourself. Pay attention to your breathing, or quietly step out and go. As you feel like you can participate, Please do so. So let's begin. Get comfortable. Be alert, awake, but relaxed. And if you like, you can close your eyes or find a spot on the floor that you can focus on. And I want you to start, I want to start by inviting you to find your breath. Notice what it feels like to breathe in. And settle into the moment to feel yourself quiet and feel the room quiet. See if you can track your breath for an entire cycle. Breathe in and breathe out. You might try breathing in for a few beats and pausing for a moment, feeling the tightness in your chest, perhaps the burning or fullness of your lungs. before you breathe out all the way. And it may help to breathe out a few minutes longer than the breath in, which can signal to your body that it is okay to be safe now. You might imagine that our time in the Word today is like shaking up a snow globe. 
And all the ideas and thoughts and feelings have been shaken. And they are swirling. And I want you to notice them as the snow globe steadies. And all the ideas and thoughts and feelings begin to drop slowly, moving down to rest. And if while I'm talking you feel the snow globe shake again or you hear a noise or a thought comes into your mind, I would just invite you to imagine that snow globe steady and just observe again as everything settles. Nothing will be lost. Everything is contained. And you can rest. I invite you to place your hand on your chest or you can imagine doing so if you like and I want you to slowly press your ch on your chest with your fingers and for a moment be your chest and feeling the hand touch you feeling the hand saying I'm with you. Feeling the hand say, you're not alone here. And then switch for a moment and allow yourself to be the hand that's touching. As you press gently on your chest, Feel yourself be the one who's bringing comfort as an extension of love itself back to you. And then widen your gaze of this moment and feel yourself being both loved and loving. That the cycle is happening this moment in your body as your hand moves love to your chest and it feeds out through your arm and hand and there is an undoing of aloneness. And from this place of being wrapped in love, I want you to call to your mind a moment when you felt loved and seen. It could have been by some, someone you loved or someone who loves you but it's that sense of being seen and known and loved and you are enough. 